chapter 2, verse 1, it says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf, and for those who are at Laodicea, and for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the fullness, full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Paul also wants the hearts of the Colossians and the Laodiceans to be encouraged. In James 3.16 it says, For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. And Paul doesn't want that to happen in that church. But what kind of love is Paul really talking about? There are so many things fellow believers like to do that I have no interest in, and the same goes for them. So how are we going to bind together in this love that Paul is talking about? It's no different than you who work in a workplace. You may start working out with someone and say, Oh, God, give me the strength because I don't know how I'll work with this person. But after you get into the job and get working, trying to accomplish whatever job you are supposed to be doing, and start working together, you start to love that person, know them, understand them, care about them, and they about you. How much more, while we're building the kingdom of God, should we love one another and care about one another and see how God is working in each other's life to bring about that which he has planned? Having godly love for one another opens the door to a wealth of God's knowledge. It says in James 3.17, it says, But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, and good fruit, unwavering, without hypocrisy. All wisdom and knowledge is hidden in Christ. You People come out and they say, oh, this is a great saying from who knows who. It came from God. If it's wise, if it's great, all wisdom comes from God. Real wisdom is not hidden in secret books. Those are men's philosophies. That's what's hidden there. Those who follow Jesus have access to this wisdom. And they have access to all the knowledge that God has. Again, going back to James chapter 1, verse 5, it says, But if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Isn't that good news? You need some wisdom? Ask God. He's going to give it to you. Paul is wanting them to have a true knowledge of God's mystery. He explained how the church is the body of Christ back in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24 to 26. And in verse 27, he explained that Jesus indwells the believer. He is proclaiming that Jesus is the revealed mystery of God. If Jesus wasn't a mystery, he never would have gotten crucified. You think the enemy of our soul would have got Jesus crucified if he knew he was putting his own head in the noose? No, I don't think so. He didn't figure that mystery out, but God has revealed it to us who believe. Looking at verse 4 of Colossians chapter 2, it says, I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. Paul's wanting this church to know, I care about you. I don't want anybody to persuade you that the things that you are learning are wrong. I want you to be fully convinced that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Epaphras has taught them exactly what they needed to hear. Don't depart from what he has told them. He doesn't want people to be deceived by those who claim knowledge. God's word is truth. It's not fables. It's not mysteries. It's nothing made up by man. Jesus is the living God building up his everlasting kingdom. Colossians chapter 2, verse 5, it says, For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted 
and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. We're to be rooted in Christ so that Jesus can build up our faith in him. To be rooted in Christ comes to us through receiving sound instruction. What is sound instruction? If there's somebody wrong, it's not the Bible. The sound instruction comes from God's Word. As we all know, roots of any plant is where the nutrition for the plant comes from. If that plant looks beautiful, it's because the roots are in some good soil. And we're to be firmly rooted in Jesus. There's no other soil that will help you to bear fruit of eternal life. Moving on to verse 8 here, it says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. And today there's uh, some false teaching going around how uh, Jesus said we have to just love everybody. Well, there's some truth to that. Where's the deception? Well, Jesus also taught us to be righteous. He also told, taught us to stand up against evil. He also taught us uh, to admonish people that are going astray. Also, some teach that Christians are to be loved and accepted by the world. We're just supposed to, everybody loves the Christian. But Jesus said Christians would be hated by the world because of him. Some will might tell you and try to deceive you and say, oh, just dream big. God will fulfill your dreams. Close. But it's not true. The Bible does tell us where there is no vision, the people perish. But where do you get your vision? Is it your dream? Is it my dream? Or is it what God wants to do? Is it what God is telling me to do? Is it what God is leading me into? So let's take what God is leading us into and make that our dream. That is our vision because he gives it to us. Jesus said that we're to exalt the Father and to do his will. And what is the will of God? It's, Here am I, Lord. Send me. I don't know where and I don't know what you're going to do, but you put it in my heart and mind and soul and I will do it. There's also a false teaching about uh, how we're not supposed to offend the beliefs of others. Jesus said the word of truth would offend the world. So there's a lot of things that can lead us astray. And maybe those things you say, well, I can't see me uh, getting lost. I can't see me uh, giving up all that God's given me because I think along those lines. And you'd be absolutely right. But you're closing the door to many things God might want to use you for. When we put our thinking before God's thinking, we lose out on what God would really like to use us for. Paul goes on to say, For in him all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Oh, if that doesn't spell out how Jesus is fully man and fully God, I don't know what does. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 2, it says, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that it is coming and now it is already in the world. We're part of the body of Christ and the spirit of Antichrist isn't going to take me out of the body of Christ. I'm made complete in him. It says again back in James, got a lot of good stuff in James today, Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. So what circumcision is Paul talking about? The Gentiles did not circumcise the foreskin of the flesh, 
as the Jews did. Some Jews, they called them the circumcision party. They, they thought, hey, we've got to get these Gentiles circumcised, or else how can they be saved? Uh, the circumcision required for believers is not done with hands. That's what Paul said. We show that we've died with him when we're baptized in water. We're buried in that water. We're buried with Christ. And we've taken off the old man. And we raise up out of that water. We raise up unto new life. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's the circumcision that leads to eternal life. 1 Corinthians 6.14 says, Now God has not only raised Jesus, but by the same Spirit will also raise us up. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So we are dead to self and alive to Christ. Romans chapter 6 verse 4 says, Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Lots of Bible verses. I just pulled a few proving that we have been circumcised in Christ. In Colossians 2, 13 to 15, it says, When you were dead in your transgressions, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. So when we read verse 14, it was telling us that we have canceled out the certificate of death. How did we do that? Well, we didn't. Jesus did. He paid the debt. He didn't owe a debt, but he paid the one that I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. I couldn't do it myself. But Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. He nailed my sin to the cross in his body. I should have died there, but Jesus took my place. You know, this isn't a loan that we can repay. It's a debt. We owed a debt, but Jesus paid it in full. He didn't give me a loan. He gave me himself. By taking our sins away, Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities of this dark world. They've got no power. Jesus has all the power. In 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8, it says, No, the wisdom we speak of is the mystery of God, his plan that was previously hidden, even though he made it for our ultimate glory before the world began. But the rulers of this world have not understood it. If they had, they would not have crucified our glorious Lord. The pit that was dug to destroy Jesus is filled with those who dug it. Jesus is not in the grave but he's risen from the dead. Actually, if you think about it, Jesus made a mockery of those who crucified because they couldn't keep him in the grave. All the seals, all the soldiers, everything that they had planned to keep him locked up in that grave, they were very unsuccessful. Jesus showed his power over the devil. He showed his power over demonic beings. When he walked on earth, he triumphed over all power. Colossians 2, verse 16 says, Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of the angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the entire body, being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments, grows with a growth which is from God. Mosaic laws, uh, they were a symbolic representation of Jesus Christ. They're useless to the believer. Now, we don't have to have something symbolic of Christ. We have Jesus Christ. Jesus has fulfilled the law, and we can only be perfect in him. 
In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 and 2, it says, The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come. Not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under the system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped, or the worshipers would have been purified once for all time, and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. He said, he said really getting in and explaining the errors of these heretics, uh, people that were worshiping angels, uh, they considered it an expression of humility. Well, you know, who am I? I'm just not worthy to talk to the Lord. I, I'll pray to an angel, and that angel, he'll get the message to God, you know. Let's, so he's uh, much higher up than I am right now. So, nonsense. Man was unworthy to come to fellowship with God in the first place. But we come to the Father through Jesus the Son. When Jesus died on the cross, if you remember, the curtain that was between the holy place and the holy of holies was ripped in half and made access into the holy of holies. Jesus Christ was that curtain. Jesus Christ was that veil. Jesus Christ is the one we come to to have access to the Father. Some of these false teachers were saying their visions were more important than the scriptures, that their vision was the latest revelation uh, all visions have to line up with the Word of God. Uh, we, we have religions that are built upon visions, and the visions had nothing to do with the, well, I can't say they had nothing to do with the Word of God, but they were uh, taking the Word of God and making a mockery out of the Word of God to have their vision. Uh, anyone who gets a vision is not more important than the Word of God. In fact, they're not more important than anyone else. I know, as I said before, where there's no vision, the people perish, and we do get visions from God, but we know it's from God when it lines up with the Word of God. Colossians 2, 20 to 23. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with you? in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. Christianity is not a list of do's and don'ts. The key issue is we cannot please God by our own works. God is reaching out to us to show us the way of salvation, uh, some of these false teachers may have the appearance of wisdom, and they may be teaching as though they got everything uh, right out of the Bible, but when you start looking and saying, well, that's really not what it says here, no, it really doesn't say that here, and they're taking everything out of context to make followers of themselves, um, we always just remember, my efforts to live a right life are going to fail. Their efforts to make me do this and do that and do the other thing to live a right life is going to fail. My righteousness is in Jesus Christ. I must die with Christ to the things of this world and live a resurrected life in Jesus. That's my decision. I have to make it. You have to make it. No one can make it for you. Jesus Christ, he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He is with us always. What a great Savior we serve.